James O'Loughlin is one of Australia's most entertaining comedians. He's also a corporate speaker and media personality. James has hosted over 300 episodes of The New Inventors on ABC TV, has his own podcast, and is a familiar voice on radio. He's written 10 books, including six novels for children and four nonfiction books. His latest book is a work of fiction, and it's called Criminals. Thank you so much for joining us today, James. Great pleasure. What a fantastic book. Oh, my goodness. So even while I was reading it, Criminals, I was already texting a handful of people saying, you're going to love this book. Oh, wow. Go get a copy. Um, And, in fact, just then I was telling my partner, you've got to read this next. (laughs) Oh, thanks. I'm going to check all your other podcasts now to to see if you see that at the beginning of every interview. Well, I don't. (laughs) So um, for people who haven't got their hands on a copy yet, um, can you tell us what it's about? Yes. So it arises from my time as a criminal lawyer working at uh, Legal Aid in Blacktown about 20 years ago, and I met and worked with lots and lots of criminals. And this is about three different people, Dean, a a small-time break-and-enter merchant who decides to commit one big rob, uh, one big job, a robbery on a leagues club to uh, cash up. Uh, Sarah, who's an ex-copper on stress leave behind the bar when Dean commits the robbery. And Mary, a depressed middle-aged woman, ex-school teacher, sitting in the bar drinking gin in a lonely, sad fashion when Dean comes in and commits a robbery. And that one event is like a, 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 a... you know, a a rock dropping in a pond and the ripples go out and it changes all their lives, really. They're all in a a deep, dark pit when the story opens, unlike a lot of books where the character's in a relatively normal position when the story opens. They're in a deep, dark pit and hopefully the reader will be interested to know how they got there and can they get out of that pit. That is the key, isn't it? Because it's actually, it, the book gets the story. I mean, it's it's a great story, but the story gets you in from the first page because of the characters, in my opinion, because you really want to know their backstory and you really want to know, obviously, what happens next. But let's unpack that in a sec because I would love to give um, – uh, our audience, just a bit of context. Many people are already familiar with you, with your work as a comedian. You have your own podcast. You've obviously written books. Just take us back, though, because you started off as a firstly a corporate lawyer who then became a criminal lawyer. So, in the first instance, why the switch? And then, secondly, when did you think? When was the thing that made you start thinking? Oh, I want to try writing. Yeah, great, great, um, great question, and it's kind of relevant to the story too because I had my own, well, kind of very middle class private schoolboy time in the pit, and and for me it was when I was became a corporate lawyer, and I realised I'd had all these advantages growing up in life, and I'd stuffed it up because I was in a job and potentially a profession that I hated. I hated being a corporate lawyer. And it made me realize that I had to take some control of my life. So I did two things. I became a criminal lawyer and worked for legal aid at at, at a Blacktown local court initially, which I loved. And I became a stand-up comedian, something I'd previously been drawn to, but had been too scared to do. So becoming a corporate lawyer was really the turning point in my life. And everything since then professionally has been much, 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 much better. Um, When did I want to start writing. So I started writing a story. I mean, I was really fascinated. I went to a private school in Canberra. My first day at Blacktown Local Court, I met and was representing people I didn't even know existed, people who'd had horrible upbringings, people who were addicted to everything, people who'd been violent to people they claimed to love, uh, all these things, and it was incredibly eye-opening. And and over the next few years, you know, it was clear that lots of people were interested, you know, in wow, oh, what's that like? What's happening? And of course, everyone knows how fascinated people are by crime stories on in books and on, on the radio. And I realised I had a pretty unique perspective. That is, I, I I knew crime from the criminal's point of view. You know, I met hundreds of people like Dean, young, underprivileged people from difficult backgrounds who'd got addicted to heroin and were 
committing crime to fund it. I met lots of middle-aged women like Mary, depressed uh, women who seemed to have a decent life but had an emptiness at the heart of it and were shoplifting for stuff they didn't need um, and they could afford because they just wanted to feel something again. And I met lots of cops like like Sarah, people whose job it is to run towards trouble, not away from it, and I had a lot of admiration from them and, and, and also saw how just making a tiny mistake in that job could have huge consequences. So I just thought with that insight, it was a great way to write a story. So I started writing one then about about crime back in like 1997 or something, and then other stuff happened. Um, I, you know, I was on radio and TV and had kids and finally got back to it 20 years later. <laughs> okay, so what was the seed of this idea, though? What was, you know, what made you think about this story? Mm. Yeah, the first one was three people and they're all present at a robbery and and the robbery changes all their lives. That was the germ of the idea and that kind of was consistent thematically right through. And then it was a matter of working out, I think initially I had five, um, who the people were going to be and how one event can change all their lives. And I guess the other idea behind it was, you know, lots I do a podcast with Professor Ian Hinkey on, on mental health, and I'm very interested in that. There's a huge link between uh, having a mental illness or a mental health issue and, and crime. And so I wanted each of my characters to have something. So Mary, the middle-aged woman who shoplifts, is pretty depressed. Sarah, the cop who's made a mistake and it had huge ramifications, is on stress leave, is really anxious. And Dean, the uh, the 22-year-old break and enterer, he's just in denial. Well, he's addicted, but he's in denial. My favourite line in the whole story, one of them anyway, is when he's been arrested for his third break and enter and he's in the cell and the legal aid solicitor, and I used to do this, kind of would try and uh, convince, you know, try and convince your client going to rehab might be a good idea. You know, that could be the cause underneath all this crime. Ever thought of like, you know, getting to the whole nub of the addiction thing? And she goes, do you want to, uh, you know, do you want to go to rehab to, to confront your heroin problem? And he goes, I don't know if I call it a problem, more of a hobby, really. <laughs> so he's in denial, right? He's just living day to day. So these three characters, Dean, Mary, Sarah, they are so, they just get you in, as I already mentioned. And they're very, they're, there's there are many layers to them. They have a lot of depth. So did you do a lot of character development before you plunged into writing or did you discover them as you wrote yeah, that's a, a great question too. I'm a, I think I'm a discoverer. I'm a bit more really? of a, yeah, I'm a bit more of a a, a a planner for plot. But for character, you kind of find it in there. So in one of the early scenes, I wrote for Mary, she was writing a letter to her daughter, and I thought, okay, that's interesting. That's something she cares about. Let's see where this goes. Where is a daughter? Is this kind of a confessional? Is this a good kind of reflecting device to get, you know, because she's very close to the world. Is this some way of getting into her inner thoughts, communicating with someone in an open way via writing to, perhaps she's writing to her, perhaps her daughter's overseas, you know, with, with Dean, you know, I had literally met hundreds of people in my five years at Legal Aid um, like Dean and and I, I, I had a sense of how he talked and I just had a sense that with Dean, it's all got to be about today because if you think about tomorrow, it's terrifying because sooner or later you're going to get arrested and you're going to get, go to jail. You kind of know that. And if you think about the past, well, you're running from something in the past. That's why you're taking heroin. So you don't want to think about that either. So it's just kind of high energy whizzing around today and and just not allowing anything else to uh, and to, to, to kind of, you know, not allowing the past or the future, trying to block them out continually. And with Sarah, Sarah was kind of the hardest. Uh, she was a cop and I'd never been a cop. And <laughs> um, that sense of, but the, the key to her for me was that sense that, and her father's a cop and all she's ever wanted to be was a cop. And, and, and she loved the responsibility that came with it. And she loved the idea of applying rules and separating wrong from right, guilty and innocent. And then something happens to her and she makes a big mistake and she realizes that the world's grey. So, so or, or, or 
th- that things aren't as black and white as she's always thought. And cops do have to, you know, cops don't make laws, they apply them. And they, you know, you say, I was, I'm only going 65 kilometers, five kilometers over. And, you know, it's a three laid highway. And they don't, they say, their job isn't to say, I totally understand that. I've done it myself. <laughs> their job is to say, you're, you know, you're this side of the line. You've broken the law. You're not that side of the line. That's simple as that. Um, so what happens when a cop suddenly has to start dealing with shades of grey? So that was my kind of, yeah, so I just started with, I don't even, you know, see, don't you reckon, Valerie, authors, when, when you talk to them, they always pretend it's all been planned out. But, <laughs> you know, they was, oh, what I tried to do is this and that. But actually you're just flailing around and you don't know what you're doing until hopefully you see some shapes through the clouds. <laughs> Well, it's it's very tight. The, the 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 whole story is very tight, and there aren't any. One of the things I was thinking to myself is every word works. It, there's no, you know, fat. Um, but it's interesting that you say that you discovered your characters as you wrote them because that I, I would have picked the opposite. It went, you know, if I was guessing. But you've just said that you are more so a planner of the plot. So talk to me about how you plotted it like did you know what was going to happen before you started writing and when you plotted it in your head or on a piece of paper or whatever what did that look like did you actually write an outline or did you just let it brew in your head yeah yeah um I I, I've always tried there's some great writing maxim act one get your characters up a tree act two throw stones at them act three get them out of the tree and I think the temptation is always to try and work out how they're going to get out of the tree too soon. And if you do that, the danger is you don't get them high enough in the tree or you don't throw enough stones at them because you're too scared about getting them out. So I always try and up the jeopardy, you know, as much as I can and get them into the worst possible situation I can. There's that other great writing maxim, be cruel to your characters and be as nasty to them as I can until you get them to the point where they're in maximum jeopardy. And hopefully the reader is going, whoa, they're stuffed. You know, I don't know how they're going to get out of this. And then you just try and work it out. And and sometimes if it's just too hard, you just got to say, okay, maybe we just pull, you know, bring them a bit lower in the tree because then we'll be able to get, but you might as well start with them so I think at, at some point in this story, each of the characters reaches a really, really, really low ebb and you think they're stuffed, hopefully. Um, and that's when you can start trying to find a solution. And that's good. Like I've, I've written six novels for kids as well. And that's kind of been my approach with that too. And I do find, you know, it's kind of like walking through a forest at night with a flashlight. You can't see to the end of the forest, but you can see a bit a bit ahead. And then when you get to that bit, you can see a bit further ahead. So I almost think that trying to, for me at least, trying to resolve the story in a plan before you actually know all the intricacies of the story and you've got it there, you know, 50,000 words of it or something, to me is too hard because you don't know that. I mean, it can all look beautiful in a plan, but if you've written 50,000 words of a plan, you realise that, you know, a third of it didn't work and you have to change it all, which means you have to then change, you know, the plan for the rest of it. In that case then, did you, it sounds like you did a bit of a hybrid of having sort of a loose plan and then you'd kind of see what happens because it would depend on what happened before. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, people say to me, oh, I, I, I'm writing a book and, you know, I got, I just got stuck somewhere. And I would say I get stuck like five times a day. You just, but maybe you don't know what happens next, but maybe you know what happens after that. So I would think just, right. just, just place the jigsaw plot puzzles, you know, the jigsaw pieces wherever you can, whenever you can. So I'm writing a, a murder mystery now. Um, and I, there's this, you know, the beginning's pretty good, I reckon. And I know what's going to happen in the end. You know, like you have to kind of with a murder mystery, but there's this big thing in the middle. that's just terrifying. Uh, you know, <laughs> and I have no idea whether I'll be able to, it's like building two sides of a bridge and hoping they meet in the middle, but they usually do. You can normally make them. Um, 
That's the magic when that happens, really. <laughs> yeah, the <a> relief. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So you've got um, Dean, Mary, and Sarah, and you actually write from each of their points of view. And that's why we get to know, we really do get inside their heads. And you alternate. Um, uh, well, sometimes it's Dean, sometimes it's Mary, sometimes it's Terry. How did you plot that out? Like, and, or not, not necessarily plot that out, but um, how did you determine who was going to be next? Did you write it in a linear fashion and think, well, now it's going to be Mary? How did that work? Yeah, yeah, that was pretty hard too. So I had three documents initially and I was writing each of their stories in a separate document and trying to work out how they would resolve you know, what the arc was for each one, where would they get to in the end? And also it was really, really important that each of the stories touches each other and each of the three characters influences each other. And and they do that sometimes subtly and not, not that many times in the book, but they do influence each other and their influence on each other is really profound. Like a re- easy example is, you know, Dean commits a robbery and Sarah and Mary are there and Mary sees Dean, Mary depressed, nothing works, nothing makes her happy. She sees Dean alive, committing this robbery in danger. And she thinks, well, learning French and gardening hasn't brought, brought me, you know, back into any sort of enjoyment of life. Maybe crime will, maybe that'll make me feel something. So that's why my Dean influences Mary and then, and so on at various times they touch each other. So that had to happen or else it'd just be three separate stories. Mm-hmm. But then, so once I had the three separate stories worked out and the join points, then you have to marry it all up chronologically and make sure there isn't like, you know, of, of this 10,000 words, there aren't, you know, 6,000 of one speaker. It all has to be. So that, yeah, that was kind of complicated. And I had a big, big, you know, spreadsheet sort of thing with different <laughs> people's names highlighted. And I was like, oh, there's too much green there. There's too much, de- you know, there's too much Dean in that bit. I have to spread it around. So it is hard. It's kind of the, you know, writing is kind of the logic, the the, the creative bit, but also very much important to have the, the logic structural bit. Yes. So with that, that is fascinating. You had three different documents for the three different characters. Did you write say, the whole of Dean's story, then the whole of Mary's story, then the whole of, or, or did you just kind of write wherever? Yeah, wherever I could, again. Yeah, <laughs> Where, right. Whenever I could work out what was what was going to happen next. So um, uh, kind of, I don't think there's a spoiler because it happens pretty early, but Dean commits the robbery wearing a balaclava. But if you saw, if, if someone walked past the street, past you in the street wearing a balaclava, but you knew them reasonably well, you know, you, you might recognise, kind of, you might recognise their voice, you might recognise their body shape, their body language. So Sarah thinks she knows, that, that she recognises one of the robbers, but she doesn't know where from. Um, and, you know, maybe it was someone she arrested when she was a cop and, and she goes on this exhaustive search. So that that's, um, so I knew that bit, that was a point of intersection. So I had to follow that along. So then Sarah maybe identifies Dean. What happens then? Dean gets arrested. So what happens when he gets arrested? He's skipped bail. So he's probably bail refused. So he's at the jail. So sometimes when you're lucky, you get that kind of inevitability of things happening that is also hopefully surprising, um, surprising to the reader. Um, Just from, again, one, one rock dropping in a pond and those ripples going. Mm. Now you're not only an author; you you do many other things. <laughs> um, so, in terms of fitting in your writing, when you are in first draft of writing, let's take this book, Criminals. Um, or do are you dedicating a particular block of time to it, or are you just writing whenever in, in the middle of the other things that you're doing? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so whenever. So really? the great thing for me about writing. Well, the two good things is that I don't need any rituals. I don't need to light a candle or, you know, any Some of that. Some authors do. I know, I know. And they have a, <laughs> a sacred space and all that, and I respect all that. But luckily it's not me. Um, I wait till the kids have gone to school, then I set up on the kitchen table, and I do have quite a lot of other work. But the good thing about it is is when I don't have any other work, I'm relieved because I can concentrate on whatever book I'm writing rather than, you know, as most people in the industry I'm in that, you know, 
terrified. I, whenever I didn't have any work in the past, you think, well, game's up now. It's all over. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm just relieved. And if I've, you know, I sometimes do uh, speaking or, or emceeing of conferences, I'll, I'll work on my book in the taxi on the way to the airport, on the plane, on the taxi, on the, at the other end. Really? So, you can focus like yeah. in the taxi on, on the way to the plane? Yeah. 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 Do I, you, I, I is it that easy? Quite, uh, well, writing's never easy, but that, that bit's no. Like I always think writing a story is so hard. Any other peripheral things like being in a taxi, that, that, that's just small change, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. Okay, so can you give us an idea of the gestation period for this book? When did you think of the idea and start writing and how long in in the middle of going to taxis and, <laughs> and, and stuff did you did it take to finish it? So, so I wrote, um, I wrote five kids books from 2000 and first one was published in 2014, last in 2019, I think. And whenever I'd finish one and they were, that was largely because my own kids were the age where they might read them at that point. They're they're older now. So I've stopped writing kids books. (laughs) Um, But whenever I'd finish one, then I'd just go back to this and this idea of the robbery. It, I just, it was called the robbery for a while. And who are the characters? What's going to happen? But then something else, that, you know, and then I'd have to start editing the next kid's book or whatever and offer to go again. So I really started concentrating on it, I think, in 2019 and finished it in 2020. So I probably took a you know, a year, but I'd already kind of planned it a, a, yes. a bit. Yeah. Right. So you really did write this in in between times, really. In, <laughs> well, as you might remember, the <laughs> there was a fair bit of in between times uh, in our industry <laughs> in 2020. So yeah. I had a fair bit of time <laughs> that I wasn't going in many taxis to airports in, true. Uh, <laughs> after March 2020. <laughs> true, true, true. Okay. So then you um, uh, submit it to your publisher. What did the – was there a great deal of feedback in terms of structure or in terms of the edits? So firstly, I'd submitted it to uh, some trusted friends and uh, and my wife, which breaches Margaret, Margaret Atwood's 10th rule of writing, which is make sure you show your writing to people but never your intimate partner because it'll destroy your relationship. So I'm very <laughs> lucky that – uh, my wife, Lucy, is very, very gentle, but also clear with her uh, with her feedback. And a couple of friends, three friends of mine read it too, and they had decent feedback. Um, and, and actually, I changed the beginning of Mary's story because of... Um, some feedback my friend Scott gave me where he said, oh, she's got to, she's, she should be a bit, what do you say? She should be a bit murkier or dirtier or something like that. He thought she was starting her story sitting alone in her lounge room was a bit tame and she should wake up in a stranger's bed and full of self-hatred. So I did that. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, and then, yeah, when it got to, when it got to Echo, um, um, they – the changes were pretty minor. Uh, then they had some wonderful feedback. It, it did the editor Sam Cooney, um, um, but you know it wasn't like you know th- there weren't major changes. Happily, but happily it's, it, it sounds like you had some really good beta readers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's so useful to do that. Like I used to have mm-hmm. my kids right for the five mm-hmm. kids novels I wrote between. Um, you know, in the 2010s, as soon as I finished or even when I was halfway through, I'd read them and they go, you know, I'd, I'd spend half a day writing this beautiful, I thought, Tolkien-esque two-page description of a forest. And after a line and a half, my middle daughter and Nina would go, yeah, I get it. It's a forest. You don't have to keep going on about it. It's got trees, leaves. I know what a forest is. What happens next? <laughs> oh, I love it. What, if you could, um, if you had a pie chart um and you divided up your your activities what percentage is writing what percentage is you know all the rest and what what, and what is in all the rest these days well without revealing too much i would say that the pie chart between time and the pie chart between income there are vast discrepancies there (laughs) yes i understand that (laughs) (laughs) um but I, i would say 
of my working time, at least half is writing writing books and half is all the other stuff, I think. Yeah. Okay. And so you're writing a murder mystery now. Mm. Um, how long has that been brewing in your head and and when is that going to be out? Yeah, well, I'm hoping, I mean, I think I'm about 39% of the way through it. That's my guess. <laughs> and I've got a technical deadline of um, December the 31st that unfortunately I know is a little bit flexible. So, you know, it's better to not to know your deadlines are flexible because it tempts you to um, to, to be lax with them. Um, so that book- But can I just say that's a crap deadline because it means that you have to work through Christmas. Who decided on that deadline? That's ridiculous. Well, you know, they do <laughs> say, can you get it in by the end of the year? And you say yes. So I guess <laughs> you, you're right. So really it's a deadline of December 20th, isn't it? Because nothing's happening in those last 11 days of the year. Um, but, yeah, well, Echo were, were – I pitched it to Echo and they were kind enough to say yes and – um, so the end of the year, but I know mm-hmm. it's a little bit rubbery, but hopefully I'll, I'll get it. But, but um, so that I was working on that before something else intervened. Um, and that was another book I've just finished, which is a collaboration with Professor Ian Hickey, uh, a psychiatrist and, and brain and mind head based on our podcast called Minding Your Mind, which is a, a book about mental health, where he really su- supplies the knowledge, I supply the curiosity, and, you know, we've turned that from a podcast into a book. So I've just handed that in, or we have just handed that in. That probably be out in October. And then, so now I'm free to go back to the murder mystery. So, yeah, I reckon I read about 38% of it before we started working on the Minding Your Mind book, and now I'm back back into it. And with that, um, you, are you are you working on it every day? And are you um, do you aim for a because you've got to finish it? And and by the end of the year, you're thirty eight percent through. <laughs> so there's a very clear amount that you need to achieve. Do you have a word count goal per day or or, or per week or anything like that? Not really. Um, <laughs> I do. You know, I I mentioned the competing pie charts. I kind of, you know, prioritise, like I do a lot of speaking and MC work and that's more, you know, something next week. So you've got to prepare for it. You've got to do it. So I need to prioritise that. And there's a lot of that around at the moment because it's all the stuff that was postponed five times during COVID. Mm. Um, uh, So I need to prioritise that and, yeah, just work around it. And then when I, if I feel like I'm getting behind, get that, you know what it's like, that cold chills up your spine and, and just do as much as you can. But I, I, I do think writing so hard, you know, without, like I, I did the Mining Your Mind book. We, we had a pretty strict deadline and that, I mean, we were more productive because of that and it made it hard. But when you're writing your own story about something you're making up and you do want to be, enjoying it and I also don't one of the other rules particularly when I started writing kids books was that I don't want it like our three daughters still live at home I don't, I don't want it to take away too much from family time I thought it'd be really ironic if to be a great dad I wrote these <laughs> books I my girls could read and uh, as a result you know I just never spend any time with them so I've kind of made a rule that it comes after after family time so you know it all fits in I mm. think yeah it all fits in it'll be all right I want to sidetrack a, li- a little bit because um, from from writing books because you've mentioned that you do, you know, speaking, corporate speaking, and um, emceeing, and 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 you're a very popular uh, speaker and MC and I, I've seen you on stage oh, doing it at a corporate you. event, and um, but when you do that, you do research quite a bit well the event that I was at that event or or that audience or that corporation or whatever and it's almost like a stand-up routine in itself even if you're just emceeing what you obviously do prepare Mm. for that do you write (laughs) so you're coming back to writing do you write it all down and 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 kind of white and like like really research where you're going and what thought process do you or what system do you have to ensure you have the right material for such an event? It's a very different thing to writing a book. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great question. And I remember when I started doing stand-up comedy, one of the difficult things was you can write a joke about anything. So you'd sit down and you think, whoa, what bit of anything? It's like it's so wide. But if I was doing, if I was emceeing an event for the Australian Writers' Centre, I'd say, okay, well, who's going to be there? I'd talk to you. Who's going to be there? There's going to be writers there, publishers there. Okay, what are some st- what's some stuff that will be relevant to them? What are some things happening in the industry? What are some things they'll all laugh about? Um, one of the things I learned early is if you're talking to accountants, you don't make a joke about the perceived st- stereotype of accountants because they hate that. You make a joke from their point of view about the rest of the world, not about the rest of the world, about them, right? Um, so you just try and get as close to them as possible and think, and I really like that. I love the the challenge of it. You know, you got to think of five minutes of jokes or, or interesting stuff or relevant stuff about writers or accountants or whoever they are. It's, it's, it's really, it's fun. And one of the great things you mentioned earlier, which I loved hearing you say that there's a um, something about there being no, not many wasted words in, mm. in criminals. Mm. And that's what stand up teaches you, you know, just mm. not to have any wasted words. Like a man walks into a bar, doesn't care, doesn't matter what sort of a bar, doesn't matter what sort of a man. That's all you need to know. And and there's obviously a tension between that and the book and creating a, a, a photograph or a, a, a movie for the reader. That's all you want to do. You want to mm. give them enough description to be immersive but on the other hand you want to tell the damn story not as my daughter nina said keep describing the forest too much (laughs) i love it love it okay so i always end with um what are your top three tips for people who you know want to get their novel out there one Mm. day um one of the most vital things for me was not beating myself up like every day as a writer you feel like a success and you feel like a failure. And, you know, when I was on radio a lot, I used to have lots of authors on and I'd always ask them, you know, when you get in the middle of a story, do you sometimes think this is crap, no one will care and I'm not going to be able to finish it? And pretty much everyone, I remember asking Philip Pullman this this question and he goes, yeah, of course. Like everyone feels like that. So that's just the way that it feels. Like it's a really big, scary uncertain thing so just to kind of accept that and to try and take the judgment off your shoulder a little bit like oh you're terrible you didn't think of anything for half an hour you know just go easy on yourself and I suppose the second one is um, no one can stop you getting to the end of the story except you so if you start like when I wrote my first big kids novel the adventures of Sir Roderick the not very brave I I just thought to myself I'm not going to worry if it gets published great but i'm going to get to the end you know i've started stories a couple of times and i haven't got to the end i'm going to get to the end and and if i do that that is good that is pretty impressive because i don't know if i can do it and so i just kept going until i got to the end so the second bit of advice is if you start writing and you keep not stopping eventually you will get to the end like you will the people who finish stories aren't the most brilliant writers um they're just people who just keep going till they get to the end and i suppose the third one is that well the third one this the third and a fourth the third one is that one i said at the beginning get your characters up a tree throw stones at them get them out of the tree that's a really good structure for you know think about any story you like it's probably very similar to that structure but the other one is and i tell kids this uh, all the time when I do school visits, you don't have to be a good writer to be a good writer. And what I mean by that is you don't have to describe a cloud as a, a little teardrop of smoke. You know, like some people can do that. And, you know, I was, I, I love Marcus Zusak um, uh, and he can put a compelling story with poetic language. I don't think I'm great with metaphors. I can think really hard about them now and again and, you know, sometimes get something that works. But the most important thing is that the reader wants to know what happens next. And if you've got a gift of poetic language, awesome. But if you don't, it doesn't matter. You can still be a really good writer. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, James. Criminals, everyone, get yourself a copy. Fantastic story. Um, And really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed the chat.